Hello everybody and welcome to Skirt Garage. My name is Connor and today I wanna to do a video about eight things that you might not know about the BMW M2 unless you've owned one. And the purpose of this is to kind of show you guys some of the not so glamorous but um, obvious things that you will find when you own one of these cars. So this is gonna be eight kind of random unique features that only an owner would know. And mind you guys, Please do me a favor, if I'm leaving anything out, go ahead and drop that down in the comment section down below to help out any future buyers of this car. And also, I've made a more detailed kind of driving review of this car, and if you wanna check that out, go ahead and click up here and check that out. Anyways guys, we're gonna get this video started. Let's go. Okay guys, number one is actually the leather that comes standard on this car. It's called Dakota leather and it's found in the two series of all the BMW cars. Now the reason why I wanna talk about it is because this leather is actually very tough. That might sound like a, something that's bad, but it's actually the exact opposite. Now, for context, I used to own an F80 M3. That car had the premium leather that BMW has. And within like four years, that car was already starting to wear down its bolster, it had cracks, and, I, and mind you, I tried my hardest to condition those seats. But the fact of the matter is, the higher quality of leather, the more soft it is, the more maintenance it has, the easier it wears. And so this car with the kind of more rugged and tough Dakota leather is actually amazing. I think that that's gonna make your ownership of a BMW M2 that much easier because you won't have to condition it every night, but it'll also make the longevity of this car in 20 years. It's gonna look so much better than a lot of the other cars with that more premium or soft leather. If you want proof of this, go ahead and look at the E46 M3, which is now you know 20 years old, and you can kind of see uh, what kind of shape that leather is in. Most of those cars are getting reupholstered or uh, you know the ones that still have nice leather, they've probably just been extremely well taken care of or never used. Anyways, that's all I have to say about these seats. Let's move on to number two. Okay guys, number two, and that's gonna be the robustness of this car. I know that's kind of a weird word, but it's the only word I could think about that actually describes how I feel about this car after owning two of them for over two years. I mean, this car just feels robust. And mind you, I've had a lot of the cars that are kind of in that 40 to 70 grand range. I've owned them, I've lived with them, and this above all of them, there's just no sense of fragility. And when you own a sports car, when you plan to track your sports car, when you autocross it, when you take it on back roads, the inherent peace of mind that you get when you're pushing this car is awesome. Um, it makes you worry less. It makes your ownership that much better. You're never wondering, oh, if I do this track day, I'm gonna ruin my car. Oh, if I do this autocross, I might break my suspension. You just don't feel that at all. And because of that, we're seeing more and more and more of these cars on the racetrack. We're seeing them at autocross circuits. We're seeing them um, being pushed to the limits. And I think it's just because in 2014, um, BMW came out and said like, hey, we're actually gonna really focus on this next batch of cars being strong and being reliable. And I think that the proof is in the pudding. This car uh, has taken, you know, not my car specifically, but this generation of the M2, so many people are tracking them. So many people are abusing them. And the car is just, it's just strong. It's just a, a very robust, well-engineered, well-designed car. And you guys can take um, confidence when pushing this car to the limit. So with that, let's move on to number three. Ugh. Okay, we are going to talk about the gearbox for number three. Now, what I want to talk about specifically is not the fact that I think that this is probably the easiest manual transmission in the world to live with, but what I actually want to talk about is the tendencies that you will notice when driving this car. The first one, this car doesn't like to be rushed going into second gear. And what I mean by that is if you do a, a dig race or like a drag race and you're in first and you're driving, you fly up the revs and you go into second, sometimes you will feel pushback going into second gear. And I don't know why that is. Maybe it's the synchros. Maybe there's not enough um, transmission fluid 
being pumped in to allow that gear to be given just yet. Maybe you have to wait a half second. I don't know what it is, but I feel it. And, I, and you might be able to just throw it into gear anyway, but it just doesn't, it doesn't feel right. And so if you watch this channel and you've seen this car do drag race videos, you might notice that this car loses a lot of the dig races and that's part of it because it just doesn't like to be rushed going into second gear. The other thing that I've noticed is sometimes, maybe once a week or once every other week, it won't want to give you first gear. So you'll be at a stoplight and you'll try to put into first and it'll kind of stick and kind of go halfway into gear. And when it does that, you basically have to take it out, put it back in neutral, clutch in again and go. And the funny thing about both of these tendencies is that it's not just this car. I actually used to own a 1991 E30 Touring and that car, 30 years old, um, that car had the exact same tendencies. It didn't like being rushed into second and sometimes you'd have to double clutch going back into first gear. And it's not just me either. I think on the forums, I found that a lot of the other uh, manual transmission F8X owners found that sometimes it was reluctant to go into first gear, so they did the same thing. Either they popped into second first, and then they went in, or they double clutched and then put it into gear. Anyways, definitely not deal breakers, just something you might notice in your ownership. So let's move on to number four. Okay guys, for number four, let's talk about the exhaust system on this car. So the exhaust system is actually kind of unique. It's no surprise to you guys if you are subscribers and watch uh, this channel. And if you're not, please consider subscribing. But I do drag race videos and I've done a few with this here car. And in all my drag race videos, I always do a sound comparison just to kind of hear what the cars sound like before we, we race them. And what I've noticed in my ownership of this car is that there's a lot of condensation or water that exits the left tailpipe right here. And that got me kind of curious about the configuration of the exhaust system because underneath the car, and I've been underneath it quite a few times, the inlet pipe comes over here on the passenger side on the right side of the car. So I'm curious how it comes from this side and then most of the water condensation leaves the left side. Well, there's actually a diagram showing that the, the inlet pipe on the passenger side runs over to the driver side where there's baffling that allows um, some of that to come out the right side as well. Uh, moral of the story here, guys, is that if you ever see one of these or have a friend or you own one and you rev the car up quite a bit, you will see more condensation or water leaving the driver's side exhaust. And it's not a big deal, it's just kind of funny that they designed the architecture to mostly leave one of the sides of the dual uh, exhaust tips that we have here. Kind of unique and maybe it's just a BMW thing, but that is number four, let's move on. And guys, that actually moves us neatly on to number five, and it's the sound of this car. The BMW M2, no secret, it has a large turbo on an inline six. Now that architecture isn't unique to BMW. There's actually a lot of other cars and trucks that have shared that same single turbo inline six configuration. And because of that, can you think of any other car or truck that the M2 sounds like? Because I can. Uh, my brother actually told it to me one time, like, man, that actually sounds like kind of like a diesel truck. And I hate to admit it, but I think he's right. There are some frequencies deeper in the lower RPMs of this car where if you do have a downpipe, if you do have a resonator delete, sometimes I agree it does sound like kind of like an older Dodge Cummins diesel truck. And it's nothing to do with BMW making it sound like that. It's purely just because the engine configuration is very similar. Now, I will admit that past 4,000 RPM, this car sounds like nothing else. It only could be a sonorous BMW uh, car because like I said, above 4,000 RPM, it doesn't sound like anything else besides what it is, a BMW M2. And I also really have to mention here, guys, that this is one of the reasons that drew me to the BMW M2 because it has a really kind of like mean growl under 4,000 RPM, very guttural. And then once you get above it, you know, four, five, six, seven, it's very sonorous and it really wakes up and has such a unique sound and there's no rasp which is a large reason why I went for the M2 N55 over the S55. Even though I have had an S55 engine before, um, I just think that this sounds a little better. Anyways, let's take a listen. You guys can crucify me in the comments if you disagree, but 
I have to stick by my guns. I do think it does sound a little bit diesel-like uh, under 4,000 RPM. So take a listen to the startup and a couple revs and you guys can let me know what you think. Let's go. Hop in here. Okay, pull this back. All right. Well, guys, for number six, I'm actually in the back of this car. And that's important. And the reason why I want to be in the back of this car is because it showcases something that this car can do that its competitors can't. If you think about it, the competitors for this car are the Supra, the Cayman. And both of those cars don't even come with the option of having rear passengers. So the fact that this thing has enough space to have rear passengers, actual decent headroom, and this is my driving position. I'm not exactly the tallest guy in the world, but I'm 5'11", and the fact that I have knee room, I could totally sit back here if I had to. So that is actually a really, really nice um, design feature about this BMW M2. And you can tell in the design of this car because the the rear part of the, I guess, greenhouse of the car is taller than the front half, meaning that they designed this car with the purpose of being able to have passengers in the back seats. So, pretty cool. Anyways, let's move on to number seven. Okay guys, we didn't go very far, but this is number seven. It is the actual um, seating arrangement of the seats on this car. Now, what I want to show you guys more specifically is how this seat is actually crooked. It's aiming more at the front left headlight. And I hate bringing this up because it's been brought up before in other videos, but it is true. You actually can notice this. And where you mostly notice it is down here where your thigh would be. You kind of sit on this half of the chair most of the time to be kind of lined up with the steering wheel and your OCD will get to you. I have to be completely honest here, guys. And maybe, just maybe, that's why they actually installed that little knee pad up there because they knew that although you'd be kind of aiming this way, your body tendency would want to be over here, which would ram you straight into the transmission tunnel right there. Now, mind you again, is it that big of a deal? No, not really, but it's something you should know about. Anyways, let's move on to number eight. Okay guys, we are on to number eight. And if you have made it this far in the video, thank you. Uh, please consider giving this video a thumbs up and subscribing for many more videos like it. Anyways, with number eight, we're gonna talk about the actual brake caliper. Now, if you notice, this is kind of a darker, like almost uh, a tinge of, I guess, midnight blue. And that is because if you track your BMW M2, the front caliper, or basically both calipers, will start to change color. They'll start to get darker. I've even seen on some of the forum posts that these brakes have actually changed color so much that they've wound up almost looking kind of like green in color. Most uh, end up looking black, however. Anyways, that's something that you should know if you track this car because maybe you love the blue so much you might not want to track it. Maybe you'd want to get a larger or different uh, caliper setup to begin with. I don't know but it's something that is pretty interesting about this car, so I figure I'll show it to you. Um, I think you can even tell more when I show the front caliper versus the rear. So let me grab the camera and I'll show you both. So this right here is my front caliper. With the light directly on it, it still looks pretty blue, but if you take the light off, it's pretty dark. Let me show you the back. Here is the back and you can tell it's already a little bit brighter. That Some of that might be just from the outside light coming in here. But uh, yeah guys, that is number eight. Well guys, that's gonna do it for us here on Skirt Garage. Those are just eight things that I've noticed in my ownership of this BMW M2. I'm sure you guys have noticed a lot of other things and if you want to leave them down in the comments like I mentioned earlier, please do so. I think that'll help a lot of future or prospective M2 owners 
uh, looking to know a little bit more about the car before they actually purchase one. So anyways, we will see you on the next video. Peace.